Oh my gosh. It, it, it's time for the show. Um, oh, where is everybody? Um, <clears throat> uh, hi there. I'm Kermit the Frog, and we're, uh, well, we're, we're almost ready. We're incredibly proud of the fantasy which builds on the creativity, innovation, and artistry, which are the hallmarks of not only the Walt Disney Cruise Line, but of the Walt Disney Company. <laughs> You know, somehow Disney fantasy seems a little more alive at night. In fact, it was Walt's favorite time at the park. And thanks to all of you. We'll see you after the show. All right, here we go. W Radio, your information station. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the WW Radio Show. Your Walt Disney World Information Station. I am your host, Lou Mangiello, and this is show number 647, and together we're going to celebrate the magic of the Disney parks, movies, and more as I take you from the parks to the screens and everything in between here on the podcast, my live video on Facebook, community, books, audio tours, blog, and more. Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and find everything else at www.radio.com. So this week, we're going to continue our look into the top 10 art pieces in Walt Disney World. From the parks to the attractions and resorts, we explore art that doesn't just exist on canvas or walls, but art that exists in three dimensions and in a wide spectrum of mediums. I then have the answer to our last Walt Disney World or Disney Cruise Line question of the week and pose a new challenge for your chance to win a Disney prize package. Then stay tuned to the end of the show for more information, updates, your voicemails, and our next WW Radio community event coming up very, very soon that you're not going to want to miss. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. Now let's pick up where we left off last week with our continuing conversation about the top 10 art pieces in Walt Disney World. And I, I, I was negligent and not even thinking of, of the Mer- Little Mermaid. Well, actually, that brings to mind, and maybe I'll, I'll throw this together as my next one, but I was thinking of the murals that you see on attractions or in queues, just mm-hmm. kind of in general, because... Um, thinking back to the now, I know today in the movies, you kids have your CGI and all this other stuff. But remember back in the day in like Star Wars and movies like that, when matte painting was a, a skill, and they and they still use it today. Where you know, great uh, backgrounds in movies were actually the work of these incredible painters, and they were superimposed over over the scenes. And I think similarly, in so many attractions. There are incredible murals that are included, whether it's in the queue or the backdrop of a scene. And I, for so many people, I think they might not appreciate what they're looking at. Like, that's a lot of work that went into that. Mm-hmm. And, and it goes right by um, some of the actually I'm sure you all have favorite ones you would think. And I think we can make a long list of these, but um, some that came to mind immediately were in some of the scenes in spaceship earth like the rome scene and um and some other ones and uh the the mural in the queue of maelstrom yep which which we Mm. would which we would stare at looking for the hidden mickey watch and all the other things we know about but was huge um all the murals in the in living with the land both in the queue and uh, in the attraction itself is a backdrop for the first the scenes you see, the desert scene and the um, uh, rainforest scene and all that kind of stuff. Um, just these are incredible works of art that, you know, serve the function of a background like the matte paintings did. But um, a little a little attention would would reward you with appreciating these are really fantastic pieces of art in their own right. And one I wanted to mention, well, and this I, is I, wait. So before oh, go ahead, because I, I do want to, and this is something that I really struggled with, and yeah. and I want to be 
not just respectful of, but I want to call attention to because there's a lot of things that I appreciate as pieces of art that are not art installations themselves. And what I mean by that is, and this is where that broad definition of what is art comes to be, because I want to give attention and credit to the artisans that are landscape architects that are creating these visual, living, breathing works of art. The rock work. So, uh, look, mm-hmm. look at places like Galaxy's Edge, Pandora, uh, even in, in, in other parts of, of Disney's Animal Kingdom. I was at Wilderness Lodge and I was just noticing some of the rock work. Like all of those are by definition to me pieces of art that we don't necessarily look at with that artistic eye. But I understand that there is an artistic quality that goes into the design and the execution of it, especially because we are walking through and interacting with this living three-dimensional canvas as opposed to the two-dimensional painted canvas that, that what we traditionally think of our art really is. So although we haven't necessarily mentioned those per se, I want you, you all, you, everybody, I, like it's something that very much is top of mind to me, but it's hard for me to be like, this rock in Galaxy's Edge is just, so, <laughs> but it is, and I, and it, it is, and it is. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not making light of it. Like I really do appreciate all of those elements, especially that come into the theme parks as literal works of art. What you know, when you ask like, what is art? Which you know, again, that's a lofty question. Um, it does bring that to mind. You bring up a good point with the the rock work. And even things like the Swiss family tree house and the tree of life and things like that, you know, and, and Expedi- and Everest, you know, the care that went into the rock work and the, the, the plantings and the leaves on the tree houses and all that kind of stuff. Um, whether you could categorize art, like we're talking about as, uh, how would you say art to be appreciated, like the murals and the windows and everything we talked about versus functional art that, is meant to immerse you into a world, but is not meant to be looked at as art? If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like it's uh, it, if if you're looking at it as a piece of art, then maybe it didn't work because it should be blending into the background and just creating this ambience of the world you're in. And that's a good distinction. And it's good you bring that up because there's, it has a different purpose, but the craft and the skill and the imagination that goes into it is just as important and just as uh, a part of it as any piece of visual art you see that clearly is meant to be a piece of art. So, I mean, and I, know, and I still want you to go next, but I really want to sort of put a, put a pin in this for a second because it does bring up something that I added late to my list because I actually posed this question this morning to my children because I really wanted to see from their perspective, especially from my, 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 you know, like all kids, they're yours and they're, but they're different, right? I have a 16 year old boy. I have a 17 year old girl. My daughter is, is very, very artistic. And I, when I said, you know, what is your favorite piece of art or what are ones that come to mind? Their answers were fascinating to me. And I want to mention it here because they, my daughter brought up something that I didn't think of But I agree with her 100%, and I think it very much is in alignment with what you just said. Because when I said about favorite pieces of art, they did bring up one or two things. And she said, the fireworks. Yes. Yes. She said, the fireworks. And I said, explain. I said, I wanted to hear it from your mouth. And I wish I would have recorded her. She said, the fireworks over Cinderella Castle, the projection, it's not quote unquote fine art. But it's visual art, and there are mm-hmm. visual artists that are crafting mm-hmm. an emotional story with those shells, with the music, with the projections. I said, you're right. If you don't believe me, I'm not going to lie. I was live last night from Wilderness Lodge. Um, if you go back to the August 11th show, I'm watching the fireworks from the shores of Wilderness Lodge, and I'm fine. I don't, I can't, I don't care. I'll admit it. I'm crying like tears are streaming down my face because of what I'm seeing. And I said, Marion, you're right. Like that is art. And she says, yeah, don't tell me that the people who design those shows aren't artists. And I said, you're a thousand mm-hmm. percent right. And I never thought about it that way. Well, uh, if you if uh, you can define art so many ways, but one of them is to evoke an emotional response from you. 
then absolutely. Yeah. Cause I'm with you. I, I, um, see these are illuminations back in the day or anything. Um, they, we've talked about so many times, the combination of that and music, which you mentioned as another possible form of art, but is a, a whole topic unto itself. But, but that, ex, that expression of the, and there's concepts behind these, there's story behind all of this, which, you know, and, and it gets to you and it, it'll evoke that emotional response. And that's what good art will do. So. Well done. Yeah. I love that. Love that. Yeah. Props to Marion for bringing in yeah. the, the theater side. Yep. And that's Art. a whole other thing. Yeah. Too. yeah. I, I, again, it's my my very broad what is art question was meant to do this, was meant to sort of evoke, yeah, how far do we stretch the definition of, of what art is? And I think it can be stretched not thin, but but still very, very broadly, very far. Do you want my highfalutin art school definition of art that I've crafted for myself? Well, now that you put it that way, yes. <laughs> I think about this a lot because there's the idea. Because actually, one of the things you could talk about is how about the uh, the cast member who's playing the role of the custodian outside a spaceship Earth at night with a Moppet bucket who's drawing Mickey characters in water, painting them right before mm-hmm. your eyes. Right. Um, uh, or anything else, but... Um, Look, comic I, books. Look at you know. Let, let's sort of talk about right. comic books. This is always there's always been mm-hmm. sort of the debate: is are comic books art? And I absolutely, say, I say absolutely, definitely. Well, them, I def- yeah, well, I define art. Here's my here's the little Timmy Foster definition: the intention of a creative expression, but no matter what it is, is art to the artist. You might not like it. You might not think it's art to you, but that's my definition of art. So. Mull on that. I'll write a book about it later and you can all check it out. <laughs> that was actually my one. I was just going to mention the mural. One other one I was thinking of murals in an attraction that I'm always admiring is the mural of Mexico City in the last scene of uh, Grand Fiesta Tour El Rio del Tiempo before then. Again, spectacular. And hey, let's talk about those fiber optic uh, fireworks. That's an artistic <laughs> expression. <laughs> <laughs> and one last one I wanted to mention, there's a funny and there's just a fun reason why I mention this is the um, murals that are in the Dino Institute queue at over a dinosaur, which are spectacular. And again, many people you're in the queue, you're just walking through what murals I didn't see any murals. The cool part about the Dino Institute is it's like a mini museum. So for a di- you know, kid to grow up on dinosaurs like me, I just want to stay there the whole time. But you know, keep it moving, keep it moving. So um, the reason I bring up dinosaur, though, because a little aside, you guys surely know this. You know, Dino Sue standing out there majestically in the walkways. Is Dino Sue a boy or a girl? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it is one or the other. Well, the answer is we don't know, but <laughs> I, it, it's Dino Sue because, as pretty much everyone knows, um, I mention this because today, as we're recording this, 31 years ago, on this day, Sue Hendrickson discovered the real Dino Sue skeleton on this day. It's Dino Sue's birthday today. So Tim I'm going to have a cake tonight. You are just. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you and what have you done with my Tim Foster? I mean, don't bring him back because I like the one that does all the research, but this is amazing stuff. When you give me more than an hour to prepare, <laughs> you'll see what I can do. Uh, I love it. And so, you know what? I'm actually going, I'll, I'll piggyback on what you were, were talking about. And I know that there's, there's a lot of discussion of murals. And there is one more that I felt that I really wanted to mention, not just because... I have a personal affinity for it, but because I think the challenge of creating this mural was accomplished so very well, because when you are given an artist the challenge of trying to capture and and symbolize and summarize something as ambitious as Spaceship Earth, how do you go about approaching that? And I, I give huge amount of credits to Italian artist Claudio Mazzoli, who um, 
from a very early age, devoted himself to art and was tasked with answering that question. And he actually came to California at the suggestion of, you might know the name, Disney legend, Imagineer Mark Davis, worked with Ray Bradbury, John DeCure Jr., Herb Ryman, and sort of was was a, a modern following of, of the traditional Italian Renaissance masters. And when you hear that, you're like, oh, I see that in this mural. And I love the fact that when he talks about the creation of this, he had to ask himself, where did man come from? Where are we going? And what are we looking for? And the simple one word answer that he had to that was power. And it was the power of the universe and the good of the universe. It's the life, the electricity is where we come from and where we want to go. And I'm, and I'm paraphrasing. And in this, I'll quote, in this painting, I tried to make people understand how man communicates the meaning of communication and how important and powerful communication really is. And the expression of Spaceship Earth, the story in this single piece and innovations throughout time and the past and present and, and the future, this has always been and continues to remain years later one of my favorite and I think really important pieces of art uh, in the Disney theme parks. I am so glad. I was hoping you were going to bring that one up <laughs> because I love that one. Yeah, I had definitely and, considered this one too. Yeah, and, and hoping you would fill in the blank because that's one piece of art I would, I, I do want to know more about. And I don't, I don't know the whole story, but incredible. I think it's kind of sad that it's located right there on the ramp where usually you're, you you know, you're making your way quickly through, and it's easy to catch the, you know, the caveman in the corner, or the 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 astronauts, and sometimes you miss the, you know, the more almost transparent in the background, like the Egyptian and the, you know, mm -hmm. the Greek and Roman and, you know, the, even the, the telephone operator and things up in the corner. So many times I've uh, been, was hoping the line would stop at just the right time so I could stand there for a while and yeah. <laughs> admire it, take a picture, you know, but yeah, sometimes I have Come stopped on and Come I've, on you know, I've admittedly held up the line for a second or two to, I'm respectful, but I yeah. do want to sort of capture that, that photo so I can look at it later, even though I've shot yeah. that picture a hundred times. Yeah, I've gotten it. Yeah, there's it. That's well worth. Again, it is a shame. Well, it's not a shame. It's there. It's perfect there. But it's a shame. It's not in a place where you can, you know, sit and admire it at your leisure. But some, I feel like so many of these pieces we're talking about, especially in the attractions, fall into that category. They're there. They're beautiful. But you sometimes had the briefest of moments to truly appreciate them. Mm -hmm. So I don't even, I have zero idea where we are on our list, but what do well, you we're we, done. I'm finished. Are I'm we out. done? All right. So <laughs> Kendall's like, I'm not even close to done. All right, Kendall, <laughs> give us one more and then we'll, I'll, I'll give another and then we'll hit a few of our honorable mentions of which I can assure you there are many. <clears throat> yeah, I, I have many honorable mentions, but one of the ones I wanted to talk about a little bit more is one that I think most people probably have no clue exists. And that's over at the boardwalk Inn which has a number of art pieces. And the one I'm going to go with is the rounding boards, which mm. for anyone who doesn't know, a, a carousel rounding board are the pieces that are mounted up around the top of the carousel. They're usually curved and they cover up the, the mechanical workings at the top of the carousel. And there's usually six of them. And when they're, you know, when they're hooked together, they, they form the circle that goes around the carousel. And if you think about like uh, Prince Charming's Regal Carousel in Fantasyland, he, those pictures, images from Cinderella that are on the, you know, the outside rim of the carousel. Um, but at the boardwalk, these actually are in the lobby. They're mounted above uh, the check-in desk. There's three of them mounted above the check-in desk and three mounted above the French doors leaning out. And they're, they look like oil paintings. I'm not sure what medium they were done in, but they look like oil paintings of each of the the Disney castles. So Disneyland, Disneyland Paris, Tokyo Disneyland, Magic Kingdom, Shanghai Disney, and Hong Kong Disney. And they're not depicted as they appear in in real life. They're depicted as if, you know, what they would look like in a fantasy land fairy tale in the midst of, you know, 
verdant green pastures and one even has some cattle in the foreground, you know, or kind of a, you know, a broken down fence on the pathway leading to one of them. And then each one of the, these paintings is framed in a really ornate gold molded frame, like what you would expect to see on a carousel. And I just think these are so neat because they're, they're they so well fit the boardwalk in. It's, it's a neat way to represent each of the international parks. And it's just something that I hope people would go and check out. I love that. I yep. love it. I didn't even think about it, but I'm like, she's right. She's right. She's right. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> and and while you're there, check out the Electrolier chandelier and the paintings that were done by the Boardwalk architect and the miniature carousel. And it, it really is. It's a, it is almost a museum in and of itself. Stay away from the nanny chairs. It's nightmare fuel. The shiny <laughs> twin <laughs> chairs. <yeah. laughs> but again, pieces of art that are actually signed on the back. So some of the very. Yeah, there you go. Um, Speak. Go ahead. I thought What's you were up? done, but go ahead. No, I was I mean, I have a million honorable oh. mentions if we're going through that. But, um, you know, I did what one came to mind and I'm, I'm not even sure how to quantify this, but I wanted to talk more about Mary Blair, who and very doesn't know. She is absolutely hands down 100 percent my favorite artist. And I, I love her to death. Um, we've you know, we talked about the contemporary mural and her Tomorrowland murals in Disneyland, but. Uh, her whole design for It's a Small World is beautiful, incredible. We talked about it. And what was coming to mind as we were talking about it is not, not so much It's a Small World itself, but I'm wondering if there's an artist that we can think of who you has such an identifiable style and you instantly know that's, that's Mary Blair. Mm-hmm. And you can see it in It's a Small World, obviously. But even to the point where you see new things that come up over the years, and Mary Blair didn't design them, obviously, but other artists did in that vein. But the look of It's a Small World is so iconic and so Disney that it immediately brings that to mind and connects it. And I'm thinking of things like uh, the, as we sometimes refer to it, the It's a Small World scene in Grand Fiesta Tour. Um, that scene evokes it. Uh, I remember the frozen gingerbread display that was in a contemporary in front of the Grand Concourse mural that had, I mean, Mary Blair didn't design it, obviously, but it had that Mary Blair, it's a small world distinctive style. And the thing to me was you you just recognize that right away. Like that's like to me, when I see it, that's that's Disney. And it could be in a picture that even has nothing to do with Disney, but if it's in that uh the, her style with the geometry and the colors you mentioned. Um, I don't know if there's an artist whose style is so identifiable with Disney than Mary Blair. So I, one, I agree with you Two, I want to share a Mary Blair story and three, I, ah, yes, I yeah. also, uh, I think that there is, I think that there's one other artist whose work I really like who I will wait and I will save for, for something I want to touch on at the very mm. end. I want to share a very quick Mary Blair story. And Tim, this is not to take away from the importance and gravity of your Sharf story, which really is, is <laughs> the, the keystone of this segment. But uh, years ago, I had the honor and the privilege to go to uh, Alice Davis's house to interview mm. her for the show back on show 193. You want to talk about... <laughs> an art gallery, a museum of her and her husband's work, as well as they were collectors of, of art, of amazing art from around the world. Um, they were avid travelers and some incredible original art from, you know, Africa and Asia. And it was just amazing to see, but there were also pieces that they created. And some of my favorites were, they used to, they used to write, um, uh, cards to each other and of course being artists they didn't go to the hallmark store and boy they drew them mm. and in her in her powder room in her restroom uh, and outside they had all of these framed christmas cards and especially when they were overseas that they would send to each other which were just gorgeous and i remember distinctly as i'm getting ready to to leave her home she was an incredibly wonderful and, and gracious host were getting ready to go by the front door. I can see it like it was yesterday. And in her little foyer, she had this table and sitting on the table 
was an original Mary Blair. Just oh, sitting oh wow, on the table, and I was like, "You're gonna hang this up? Like, do you what? Do you, you?" And I'm like, "Where?" It, there was this moment. I'm like, "Where am I?" Like, because there was art oh, everywhere. Wow. She had art, you know, she, yeah. that she was putting up and taking down. And I'm like, "If you're not gonna hang this up, if you need a place, I've got room in in my office." Um, <laughs> But even in, in, in Mark's studio, I mean, just some of the stuff that wow. was up there. And, and she gave me a piece. She gave me this little, you know, piece of, of Mark Davis art, which uh, I, I treasure to to this day. So oh, that's um, wonderful. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing to be able to be to be gifted to see and appreciate and, and understand some of this art. Um, one that I want to get to before we hit our list of honorable mentions. I think we've talked so much and and possibly almost exclusively in relatively two-dimensional artwork, which is why I present to you prisms, partners, and portrayal. And I give you not one, not two, but three pieces of three-dimensional art, one of which, and my daughter actually happened to mention this too, so did my son, is the prism located at the entrance to Future World, which my daughter argued very sternly for is, in her opinion, a piece of very sort of modernistic art, which is is beautiful in its simplicity, of which I agree. The partner statue. Um, again, we're ta- we we aren't talking about we haven't really talked much about statues and three dimensional pieces of art. The partner statue, and when I said portrayal, it's the portrayal of Roy and Minnie in sharing the magic. And I don't want to go too deep down this very, very deep rabbit hole. If you go back and listen to show 219, uh, I talk about the history of the partner statue and talk a lot about Blaine Gibson and his time, you know, going from an apprentice animation artist, you know, to all the work he did in terms of sculpting heads and faces and ghosts and mermaids and, president upon president upon president, um, as well as the meaning of not just the Walt and and Mickey statue, but the, the very important yet subtle meaning behind the Roy and Disney statue. And if you've ever looked at it very, very closely, we there, there's important significance to the way, and, and this is what I love, right? You can appreciate this on so many levels, the way that Minnie's hand is sort of cupped on top of Roy. And this was not just about, it's not about Roy and Minnie. It's about Roy and Walt and the support of Roy giving Walt and and the way the hands are are being held and the way they're sort of connecting um, is, is very, very significant. And I love the fact that there is so much meaning in the statue, as well as in partners and all the details that are there. So I wanted to very much acknowledge some of the three-dimensional art. And certainly, you, you can't have a discussion of art in the Disney parks without mentioning the name Blaine Gibson. Yes. Yeah. I'm glad you brought those up because I, I left – I specifically left – the Roy and and the partner statue off my list because I thought for sure one of the two of you was going to bring it up. So and he Kendall, did. then Tim, any any honorable mentions that you want to just quickly touch on? Uh, do you, do you want the the quick rundown of my whole list, or you just want me to give you, you just give you one of them? <laughs> I mean, is it a long? How long of a list is it? I, I, I'll, I'll just give you a couple by name that I would I encourage people to go check this out. Could been, this really should have been a two parter. This should be top 20 pieces. Oh, this could be. Or or even specifics. We could have done a top 10 murals or a top 10 mosaics. I mean, guaranteed. Uh, A a couple that I would just encourage people to to look at. um, The Temple of Heaven ceiling in the Mm. China Pavilion at Epcot. Wow. Incredible. Unbelievable. I don't I don't know what that is. Like, I don't know if it's just painted. I don't know how they did it. I, I've researched, tried to find out. There's there's no information on artisans or exactly who did it. But it, even photos do not do this justice. You need to walk in, stand in the rotunda, and look up. Beautiful. Uh, absolutely Beautiful. amazing. Great addition to the list. Really, really um, great. Another one I have is the, the Riviera Mosaics, mm-hmm. the Tangled and Peter Pan leading to the Skyliner Station. Um and I, I don't want to take all of what you guys have, but I, I didn't want to include an extinct 
item in my list. So I saved it for honorable mentions, but you cannot talk about art in the parks without mentioning the prologue and the promise that the piece of artwork that was again, immense 19 by 60 feet by Robert McCall that we mentioned earlier um, for the exit area of horizons, mm. just absolutely perfect depiction of what Epcot was intended to be what all that you hope it would be of, of looking at the past and the present and moving into the future and this hopeful view of it and included his family. The, the piece meant so much to him and his wife. And it's just absolutely devastating to know right, right from Marty Sklar in his last book that he wrote that they, they do not know today what happened to this, wow. that it's, it got rolled up. And he said he actually had to field a phone call from Robert McCall and tell him we we don't know where it is, okay. and I I I can't imagine that as an art like as an artist not knowing where something that you spent ten months of your life on, and just as a Disney fan knowing what that was. And I if you didn't if you never got to ride Horizons, if you've never seen it, please go Google right now what this piece of art is. It's absolutely incredible. That, I, that, I will leave my list at those. Yeah, that's, that's a great way to sort of punctuate uh, a very impressive list um, with both of those. Uh, with both of those, Tim, what about for you? Um, some random honorable mentions: the haunted mansion stretching room tapestries. Yes, come on. Yep. I have I have two of <laughs> I have two of them in my living room. I'm waiting to get all four, but all of the artwork on the haunted mansion. Um, talking about iconic Disney artwork, that's definitely there. Um, you mentioned China. That wait, made wait, me think very quickly. Oh, Mansion, go ahead. Just stop. Go more. Yeah, because you Haunted Mansion. I give credit where it's due. So much of Mark Davis. Mark is, Davis is yep. in mm -hmm. that attraction. And what I love too, and 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 I want to mention a very obscure name because Mark Davis obviously painted these very small masters for not just the stretching room, but I also had the entire sort of portrait corridor as yes. well. And mm -hmm. then other artists like. Ed Cohn and Clem Hill recreated those by hand on these large canvas scrolls. And there were not a lot. I mean, there was only maybe 15 or, or 20 of the hand painted ones that are out there, which is why when the Van Eaton and some of these other galleries have auctions, they're going for hundreds of thousands of dollars and people like uh, Doogie Hauser are, are buying them for, <laughs> for their home. But because now they obviously were able to streamline the process and, and print them on paper and replace them because with the, especially in Disneyland, sort of with the scrolling up and down, they would sort of um, get worn out over time. But I did want to sort of mention Davis specifically, as well as some of the other artists who took his work and and transferred it to canvas. It seems like that's a lot more than an honorable mention. I apologize. Yeah. But <laughs> it was on my list. Again, honorable that's mention a whole, was very high on my you list. You would have gotten there. Yeah. Um, just I'll quickly mention when you when you mentioned China, it made me think of the tile work you find in Morocco, which yes. is incredible. And, and actually, all of World Showcase, pretty much we could probably go through every pavilion and talk about the incredible artwork in detail. Artwork in any form. Uh, I was even thinking of the gardens in Japan as a piece of art, which they are. You know, that's something else you can consider. Um, I had cultural art in World Showcase pavilions just at there you go. as a whole on my yeah. list. Um, and I'll just end with, I think one of the things that is exciting, I mean, it's been exciting, but as technology rapidly advances, um, when we were talking about what is art and what are we considering, what are the forms of art we're talking about, whether the visual, you know, mosaics, paintings, music, and so forth, we're, if you don't, if you take a moment to realize we're seeing a lots of new forms of expression of art that are coming to the parks. They're coming around the world, obviously, but we see it in the parks a lot. Uh, when you mentioned fireworks, it made me think of like uh, going back to the laser projections that you see on Spaceship Earth and during the illuminations, the projection, map it, the projection mapping now that is a part of so many shows and, and that even shows that are coming for the 50th anniversary. It looks incredible. Um, the water screen technology and things we're going to see. So it, it's it's really fun to see as technology grows that there's new ways that the 
the Imagineers and the artists at Disney can express themselves and bring stories to life beyond just the murals and the paintings that we talked about in ways we could never imagine. So that's fun, exciting to look forward to and to see all this stuff come to life before our eyes. I agree. And and I will just, um, I'll wrap up with just a couple of very, very short ones. Um, for me, some of my favorite art, and, and this is what we talked about at the very beginning, you know, art is art. It's not just for the creative, but for the recipient of the art. What what we deem to be incredible art is beauty does lie in the eye of the beholder. Right? I was talking about comic books, right? For some people think comic books, and I agree. And for me, I very much have an appreciation for some of the things that we see every day, whether it's and you can see behind me, I have a park map from 1972. To me, that is a piece of art that I choose to hang in my office. Something that was high on my list and, and remained high on my list is, and, and it's not a specific, it's a it's a generality, is the attraction poster art um, from the, oh, what yes. you see in the breezeway in, in and out of Magic Kingdom. And, and what I love about this is they're able to convey not just a sense of what the attraction is, but Tim, to your point earlier on, coming full circle, the emotion. Um, I think the poster art is beautiful, and we don't know so many. Yes, we know the the Mark Davises and the Sam McKins, but you don't know the Paul Hartleys and the John DeCures and the Ken Chapmans. And I have a lot of this, and I have a lot of this literally that I bought at Art and Disney years ago. I also have. Uh, if you don't own the poster art of Disney Parks book, I have it sitting here on my desk. It's a massive book in terms of its sky in size, but it's beautiful. And it has poster art of the Disney Parks, not just in Walt Disney World, but in Disney Parks around the world, including concept poster art, um, stuff that is now extinct and has been retired. And, and it takes you through land by land. If you are a fan of the Disney parks, the poster art of the Disney parks is is without a doubt um, something that you need in your in your library. Um, mm-hmm. the, the only other couple of things I wanted to mention was some of the my favorite art is some of the art that we don't necessarily see every day when we go to the parks. And what I mean by that is the concept art. And Tim, you asked the question, well, who else other than Mary Blair is style is, is recognizable. I think Mark Davis is very much recognizable. And for me, it's John Hench. And I love, Mm -hmm. love, love the John Hench concept art. And there's actually a book called designing Disney, the art of the show. It's by John Hench. Frank Gehry does a, a preface, Marty Sklar and Peggy Van Pelt all contribute it is not just a gorgeous book to look at, but it really takes you through the art of color and the art of character and the art of visual storytelling and show. It is brilliantly written. It is incredibly accessible and understanding, but the art that Hench has in there and, and other artists as well is just gorgeous. And for me, some of that concept art is the stuff that I would love to hang because I think it it is some of the most beautiful hand drawn art. You know, think back to that original those original designs for the Disney parks for for what Disneyland. Um, you also mentioned some of the background attraction art um, I had in there as well. And the last thing I want to mention too, because I get again I think these folks are artists too, and I've always been. Um, <laughs> this is going to sound so stupid, but go with me here, Tim Foster. <laughs> It's, um, I love fonts. I know it's ridiculous. I do. I love fonts. I'm the biggest font here. Here. you'll ever want to know. Don't, don't worry. But you're in good so company, my friend. Those artists who are the font designers, who create all of this hand-drawn or computer design, it doesn't matter what your canvas is, the lettering is so important and is so evocative. And, and think about, you know, some of those wonderful flourishes on, on that Victorian style that's used throughout Main Street. US. It's gorgeous. It is absolutely gorgeous. And I know as long as we've gone on, as much as we've tried to cover, there are pieces of art and artists and styles of art that we have missed. And it is not by the, the omission is not intentional. There's just so much. And I think to a certain degree, it's all art, right? It's how we perceive it. And just the same way, I think that we are all, we all create art, 
but not everyone is an artist. And I mean that to give credit to all of us because we all create things that are beautiful and we consider art, but I also want to give special attention and recognition and appreciation to those craftsmen, those artists, those artisans that do create so much that we appreciate in the parks, whether it's visual, whether it's auditory, whether it's whatever sensory ingestion of art that we take in um you know it goes back to that first question you know what what is art uh, and if you are a fan if you're a super fan of the art of walt disney world uh, there is actually a, a book that came out in 2009 by jeff curdy i've had jeff on the show a number of times he's written some amazing books about the, the disney parks and disney cruise lines and disney history it's called the art of walt disney world and it is out of print. It is very, 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 very hard to find. I, I've seen it go for $500. Um, it is very, very difficult to find. But that, too, is an amazing, beautiful book. If you can find it, if you can invest in it, if you have an extra copy you'd like to send my way, even better. Um, <laughs> but you, Kendall Foreman, and you, Tim Foster, are literal artists in your own right uh, because not just of what you contributed to here, uh, but because of what – you do on your own. Please do me a favor, Kendall and then Tim. Um, well, first things first. If you had to sort of pick, if if you could have an image or an example or a piece of art from the Disney parks in your home, you could only pick one. What do you think it would be? Great minds think alike because I wanted to ask you guys the same question. Um, I I know exactly what I would pick and it's very obscure um, anyone who's listened to me before on the show knows I absolutely love the Polynesian Resort. And a few years ago, when they did a redo, a redesign on Captain Cook's, they added some vintage style travel posters. And each one that they have is representative of one of the island nations that is a longhouse at the Polynesian. And I would love to have the Rarotonga piece because my family ended up serendipitously several times when I lived at home, my family ended up in the Rarotonga building. My husband and I have stayed in that three or four times. And just to make it even better that the actual poster, it looks like it has one of the ferries on it. Like the boat that is on, it looks like mm -hmm. a ferry that travels on the seven seas lagoon. And I just love the style. And I have, I have, you know, tropical art and things around my house. So it would just fit in perfectly. Nice. Now, is this like for sentimental value or something that will make my heart sing Disney every time I look at it? It's whatever <laughs> is going to be the thing that when you look, I think the purpose of well, art is when you look at it, it evokes an emotion, hopefully one of happiness. So what I'll, would be the thing that you'd look at and would make you happy? I'll answer it twice. So the thing I'd love to have, I'd love to have, how could it be to have Walt Disney's original hand-drawn sketch of the Florida Project? framed it on my wall oh my gosh but i will tell you i am staring it's funny you asked that i meant to bring this up um just artwork you can take home and hang on your wall every day i look at from Pooh's garden by peter allen shaw on my wall and just am in my happy place so that's it and that's the the whole goal is is yep. you know and it's the reason why we love disney it's not it's because of the way it makes us feel right it, it's the way it makes us feel and art i think is the same way and i certainly want to know from you our friend who's been listening with us what is your favorite piece of art or what is one that we missed in walt disney world what's one piece that you'd love to have in your home i will post this question in the clubhouse at www.radio.com slash clubhouse or you can call the voicemail let me hear it i want to hear that passionate enthusiasm in your voice at 407-900-9391 kendall and tim thank you both so much i loved this conversation so so very much i my my cup and my heart is full please tell people where they can find you beyond the four corners of the podcast i'll let tim go first because i'm sure he has a lot more to discuss with regard to that than i do <laughs> oh, i'm keeping i'm keeping this short <laughs> no but over at celebrationspress.com we have the new fall issue in the works that's coming out soon more excitedly, though, next month, it's coming soon, we're going to be releasing, and it's for sale now for pre-order, our 50th anniversary collector's coffee table book. It's the biggest, grandest book we've ever done. Um, photos and facts about every attraction and resort and anything you think of at Walt Disney World for the past 50 years. 
We have a pin that's going along with it. So we're super excited. It should be out in September. I just looked at the proofs yesterday. We're so excited. So uh, that's what's going on in our world. I'm going to have to order me one of those. You are. Yeah, yeah, because I'm not sending you one. You're going to have to order (laughs) it. I I have the first um, the first holiday book that you guys did. And that's still one of my favorite Walt Disney World books. You know, we've had three more. That's okay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I when I I got it, I had never. Yeah, when I got it, I had never been there at Christmas time before. So that was the only photos I had. But then I got to go after that. And he didn't need the book. (laughs) Um, As far as work that I have out. Um, one of my blog posts just went up on WDW radio yesterday. Uh, another part in my Walt Disney world influencer series, we covered the two thousands. Um, you have to stop by and see what my pick was for the most influential edition for the two thousands. And then the 2010s will be coming out here and in, in about four weeks. And then I have a Polynesian 50th anniversary post coming out around its 50th and, and I'm sure more to come in the months to come. Yeah, oh, you're not going to tell me? I have to go look these up? To go and look. Oh, this is yeah. Great. I'm going to go check this out. This right, because when Kendall says influencers of the day, she doesn't mean like some dude in the 70s taking selfies with his selfies you know, and Instagram wall. And, uh, not that kind of influencer. A very, very different kind of influencer. Ah, uh, very cool. Very yeah. cool. Well, this was a lot of fun. I appreciate you both so much for your contributions to this conversation and really helping to open up our eyes and our hearts and appreciation for so much of the art that we see and sometimes we don't see, even though it's right in front of us. And hopefully next time we all go to the parks, we will we will look with a little bit of a different eye at some of the art that is hiding in plain sight right in front of us. So Kendall Foreman, Timmy Foster, I love and appreciate you guys so much. I promise we will do this again soon. Thanks. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Time for our Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week, where I invite you to test your knowledge of Walt Disney World history or see how well you pay attention to the details and what you see, hear, taste, or remember. If you think you know the answer, you can enter for a chance to win a Disney prize package. And this week's trivia contest is once again brought to you by you. And I mean that because as part of the WW Radio Nation, you literally help bring every episode of WW Radio to life every live broadcast, all the contests and giveaways. They are literally all thanks to you by being part of the nation. And you can find out how you can help the show for as little as a dollar per month and also get cool exclusive rewards every month like monthly scavenger hunts and trivia quests, group video calls every single month, access to our private Facebook group, shirts, stickers, monthly care packages, and much more. You can learn more and be part of the WW Radio Nation family by going to www.radio.com slash support. Now, before we get to this week's question, we're going to go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So because I have been and now will continue, I think, to be in a Disney Cruise Line kind of mood, your question last week was about Disney Cruise Line as opposed to the Disney Parks, and it was simply to tell me how many captains can you find on each Disney Cruise Line ship? First, thanks to the hundreds of you who entered, got this one correct, and let me explain. Because the Disney Cruise Line ships are really the only cruise ships to have not one, not two, not three, but, in parentheses, at least four captains. There's the ship's captain, Captain Mickey or Minnie, Captain Hook, and Captain Jack Sparrow. Some answers that gave five saying Captain Mickey and Minnie, although they aren't on the same ship at the same time. It's okay. I took it anyway. Also, some answers, also correct, said six, because if it's a Marvel day at sea, there's also Captain America as well as Captain Marvel. So basically, I took any answer that was between four and six. All of you were entered for a chance to win a Disney prize package that includes a WW Radio Nation pin and keychain and a mystery bonus prize, all of which you can only get by winning the weekly trivia contest. And last week's winner, randomly selected, is Terrence Allen. So, Terrence, congratulations. I will get your prize package out to you right away. If you played last week and didn't win, that's okay, because here's your next chance to enter. 
in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. So we're going to go back to the parks. We're going to go back in time because I want you to tell me this week, who was the host? Who was the host or narrator of Spectro Magic? Who was the host or narrator of Spectro Magic? You have until Sunday, September 5th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern to go to www.radio.com, click on this week's podcast, use the form there. Again, you're going to play for the prize package that includes the exclusive pin and keychain and mystery prize. So good luck and have fun. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in this and every week. Please come be part of the community and conversation and let me know what one piece of art from Walt Disney World would you love to have in your home or what's your favorite piece of art or maybe one that we missed in our conversation this or last week. You can talk about this and anything in the Disney, Marvel, and Star Wars universe over in the WW Radio Clubhouse on Facebook at www.radio.com slash clubhouse. You can also connect with me elsewhere on social. I'm at Lou Mangiello on Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, and Facebook. In addition to the Clubhouse, please make sure you like the WW Radio page on Facebook and turn on notifications on both so you don't miss a thing, including our Wednesday night WW Radio live show, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, as well as other live broadcasts throughout the week from the parks. And if you like spoilers, say from Marvel's What If series on Disney Plus or Star Wars or Disney, you can come join our spoiler support group over on Facebook at www.radio.com slash spoilers. If you have a question you want me to answer on the show, you can email me, Lou, at www.radio.com or call the voicemail. Be here on the air at 407 407- 900-9391. Share your thoughts about this week's show, about our favorite art pieces in Walt Disney World. Ask a question or just say hello from the parks again, 407-900-9391. As much as I love connecting with you online, nothing beats a handshake and a hug. Meets of the month are back. Stay tuned for September's Meet of the Month coming soon. I would also love for you to join us, not just on land, but on sea as well, as we'll be doing three WW Radio group cruises on Disney Cruise Line next year. February 5th through the 10th is our Marvel Day at Sea out of Miami on the Disney Magic. June 20th is our four-night inaugural on the Disney Wish. And December 5th is our very merry time cruise on the Disney Wish as well. You can learn more by visiting our events page at www.radio.com slash events and get a free no-obligation quote from our friends over at Mouse Fan Travel. Speaking of Disney Cruise Line, thank you, thank you, thank you for following along with me this past weekend from our first cruise back on the Disney Dream, I was there with Becky Mankin from Mouse Fan Travel, shared a lot of not just live video, which, by the way, you can watch the replays in the WDW Radio Clubhouse on Facebook, but a ton of stories on my Instagram. We'll also be doing a full recap and review of what the current cruise line experience is like. So stay tuned for that podcast coming very soon, as I'll also do a WDW Radio live broadcast so we can answer any questions that you might have live during one of the broadcasts as well. And if you want to get a free no obligation quote to any Disney Cruise Line voyage as well as trip to Walt Disney World, Disneyland, or any destination, you can visit mousefantravel.com. And speaking of events and things that we can do together as a community, because that's really what this is all about. The reason why I do monthly meetups and the cruises and other special events is it gives us a way and a reason to come together as a community. And that's why on September 30th, we're going to have a WW Radio special event in Epcot. It's going to be a special nighttime event and party in a private location in Epcot Center, food, fun, community, friends, and maybe a few surprises as well. I will share more details on this Wednesday night live show at www.radiolive.com, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, as well as more information about how, when, and where you can get your ticket to this one-night-only event. And if you are part of the WW Radio Nation, you know that one of the perks of being part of the Nation family is that you do get early access to tickets for events like this. Stay tuned to your inbox as I'll be sharing a link and more information very, very soon. And the last event that I want to mention is my Momentum Weekend Workshop in Walt Disney World. It is a two-day, 50-person event for entrepreneurs and solopreneurs where together we're going to use the idea of one little spark to keep moving forward and help you grow your business, brand, blog, or idea to make real changes while you're in the room as you learn, share, network, and make positive progress. 
In this interactive workshop, I am going to share lessons, not only that we can learn from the Disney parks, but practically and tactically how to apply them to you and what you do in your business and life. We'll also have a number of other speakers who have walked the walk and will share some of their practical lessons in this workshop-like environment. For more information, you can go to loumangelo.com slash momentum or send me an email, lou at www.radio.com. I have rolled back pricing this year and you can still take advantage of our early bird discount for $100 off your ticket. There are only 50 seats. We are more than 60% sold out. This event will absolutely sell out again. It's November 13th and 14th. You can find out more by visiting loumangelo.com slash momentum. Finally, most importantly, thank you, thank you, thank you. I could not do this without you and your friendship and your love and your support. I hope that the show continues to bring you a little bit of Disney magic and maybe even a little positivity into your week. And if you like the show, and I hope that you do, all I ask is that you please help spread the word, tell a friend, share a link out to this or your favorite episode. And if you can, take just a few seconds to rate and review the show over an Apple podcast. It is very, very helpful, very important. I want to thank some recent reviewers like M. Desi, who says, I just, it's just like being in Disney. Lou does an incredible job making the show informative and fun. His podcast has gotten me through some gloomy times. And whether I'd said it's a must listen for all Disney fans, listen, you'll be hooked. Lou's welcoming demeanor and positive attitude come through crystal clear in his podcast and the Wednesday Night Live chat on Facebook. You'll feel like he's talking directly to you because he is. Lou has a plethora of Disney knowledge and he helps you fill in the gaps between trips to the world with his detailed and fun podcast. Download an episode or 600. You won't regret it. Come and join the WW Radio family. Weather ad and M. Desi, thank you so much. Again, just search for WW Radio in Apple Podcasts or go to www.radio.com slash Apple and it'll show you exactly how and where to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed this week's show. I hope you enjoyed the live coverage from the Disney Dream this past weekend. I hope that you'll join me this and every Wednesday for WW Radio Live. And I hope that the show really does help make your day and your week and your month happier, inspires you to be better, and helps you to not only choose the good, but be the good for other people. Find good in everything and everyone that you encounter, because I promise you that positivity is contagious. I love, 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 and appreciate you, and those are not just words. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. If there's anything I can ever do for you to show my appreciation, please reach out and let me know. So until next time, see ya. Hey, Lou. It's Christine Morrison from Flower Town, Pennsylvania. I haven't called in in a few weeks. August tends to be um, incredibly busy around here for me, but I have been listening. I'm all caught up, and I just wanted to call in with my favorite things from Food and Wine Festival um, on the gluten-free side because I am a gluten-free girl. So, I rated everything on a scale of one to five in my book. So going back, I, my fives were the Impossible Three Bean Chili from Earth Eats, wonderful, the Shrimp and Coconut Curry Rice Noodles from the Noodle Exchange, amazing, the Tropical Mimosa and the Banana Bread from Shimmering Sips, the, let's see, the Roasted Lamb Chop from Australia, the Deconstructed Pavlova from Australia. These are all five out of five. The Wild Mushroom Beef Filet Mignon in Canada, a five out of five. And let's see, do I have any other five out of fives? In the meantime, while I'm looking, I am going to see all of you at Momentum this year. I'm super excited about it. My sister is going to drive down from South Carolina with her youngest who I have not yet met, and my daughter is coming with me. And we're all going to go to Epcot and Food and Wine after the events on Saturday. So my other five out of five, the chili quiles con chorizo was amazing, and the roasted porchetta from the swanky, saucy swine, amazing. And then the Pinot Noir, from the Swanky Saucy Swine was also amazing. Those are all five out of five, I think. 
That might be it. Oh, gosh, this was amazing. Didn't look great, but it tasted awesome. The chimichurri up offense from Flavors from Fire. These are all gluten-free items for all of you gluten-free people out there going to food and wine that were awesome. So this will be the first time ever that I'm uh, in Disney World three times in one year. Write that down. So I will see you all at Momentum. Super excited. And on the Marvel Day at Sea cruise. So everybody have a wonderful day and make somebody smile. Talk to you real soon. Can't wait to see what Lou's going to do tomorrow night in the box. Take care. Bye. Hello, Lou Mangello. It's Darlene Nagy, formerly of West Seneca, New York. And I am calling in to say we have 164 more days until our Disney Marvel cruise day at sea. I am so excited about this whole entire trip. I am counting down the days. 164 is going to fly by, I am sure, especially with having the Wine and Dine Marathon coming up and the Full Marathon coming up. And we will be on the cruise before the Princess Marathon coming up. I have the Space Coast Marathon, half marathon coming up that I'm going to be doing, and I will be cheering the other ones, maybe a virtual one, uh, eventually with my friend Michelle Knapp. I hope you guys all have a wonderful day. Stay safe and keep the moving forward going. Stay strong. Love and hugs.